Um, so our event will take an hour and a half. Um, we will have four amazing speakers um, hailing from different parts of the world, including the US, but also the Netherlands. And um, we also have a little team hailing from the US who is working on an amazing project that I'm sure you'll all be very interested in, which will help you rewild your gardens in a better way. Um, so yeah, let's get started, I would say. Um, um, we are a rewilding community of practice, and we aim to connect practitioners, landowners, scientists, um, rewilding enthusiasts. It doesn't matter how new you are to rewilding. If you've only ever rewilded your plant pots in front of your, your window, um, that's also fine. But essentially what we do want is be extremely inclusive and include people from diverse cultural, geographical and professional backgrounds. Um, so the idea is to support and inspire a community of global change makers by providing a platform for knowledge exchange, discussions, and the organization of events such as this one to mobilize uh, a new generation um, of restorations. So before we begin, um, most of us sit at a desk all day, every day. So I would like to invite you to join me in a little session of stretching nothing crazy if you don't feel comfortable with your face or your you know stretching routine being exposed feel free to turn off your camera so let's please all just get up quickly and do a little lateral stretch i hope you can see me please raise your left arm up and bend to the right side spread your arm as far as you can reach and continue to breathe deeply. So one, two, and three, and switch sides. Right arm up to the left side and breathe. One, two, and three. I'd like to invite you for a cross body shoulder stretch, starting with the left arm to the right and gently press the arm towards your body. Again, don't forget to breathe. Repeat on the other side. Three breaths, two and three. And we'll move to the side, or if you have space, I don't have much space. You can clasp your hands at the back, stretch your shoulders out and do a forward bend. So bend your body to the floor. Okay. Let's sit back down and do a few simple shoulder rolls. So shoulders up and back, keep breathing. And one more and forward. I hear lots of angry cracking in my shoulders. So if that's the case for you, you're not alone. And the last one. Lastly, I would like to invite you to bend your neck so left uh, left ear sorry to left shoulder be gentle don't forget to breathe <laughs> and forward gently roll your head to the right side and breathe and back and do a full circle and we're ready so I hope everyone's feeling slightly more focused, relaxed, and ready to get all the fantastic information that our speakers will share in a minute. Okay. So today's agenda, um, yes, next slide, please. Today's agenda will look um, like this. So our first speaker will be Chris Dagorn, followed by Brandy Williams, Frankia Ferguson, and Eva McCandy, also called Candy. And finally, we'll have a little presentation by the team at Wild Garden. Um, so that's our future community project. Um, finally, we'll have a moderated discussion and Q&A and a wrap up. So I'd like to move to present um, Chris, Oh yeah, sorry, apologies, the chat wave first. Um, so what does rewilding gardens mean to you? Um, if you're not familiar with the chat wave, it's basically a short thought or idea or a few words or even a poem 
um, that kind of make, you know, make sense to you or, or that Rewilding Gardens essentially uh, brings up in you. Um, so you can write that in the chat box. And the second I say to submit, so only when I tell you submit, you all at the same time submit your answers. So I'll give you a few seconds to mull that over. Okay. Submit. Diversity, natural, wild nature, reconnecting with nature, a way for me to join the creative process of life. I really like that one. Thank you, Michael. Make your garden wildlife friendly, peace. Um, Wendy feels like rewilding could act as a nature-based response to the environmental challenges of today. Absolutely. Hassan says nature bomb. I like that. And rewilding gardens its freedoms to let nature do what it needs at home. Very true, Jonas. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this large scale rewilding programs. Um, it can also be just your little front garden or backyard. Um, nature home peace. Amelia says wild gardens are gardens that look beautiful, native. Yeah. And acting to curb the climate crisis. Amazing. And Seep says specific mowing management measures, variation, different structures. Amazing. Bringing the outside inside and bringing local nature into your garden and making biodiversity um, a priority for the local environment. Yes. Um, I love all of these sub uh, sub submissions. Thank you so much. Whoever keeps plugging chipmunks is making my day. <laughs> Okay, extending the network of life. Wow. Um, I'm feeling really inspired. So thank you so much for all your contributions. Really appreciate those. Yeah. So we'll be learning a lot about um, some of the things you've already said. So yeah, looking forward to that. Um, one last little interactive piece. We'll have a little Zoom poll. And yeah. Oh, the chipmunks. <laughs> I also quite like chipmunks, they're very cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or is it, yeah, it is a chipmunk, cute. All right, so the poll question is, essentially we want to find out what interests you the most about rewilding gardens. Um, so you have a few options there, that the fact that it's wildlife friendly, the role of water in our gardens, shrubs and trees, native, exotic, invasive, you know, so many things it can be. Um, fruit and vegetables, and can I rewild my balcony? If you live in a place like me, London, that's a very topical issue at hand. <laughs> okay, so the vast majority of you seems to be interested in having a wildlife-friendly garden. And I'd like to remind everyone that wildlife doesn't have to be, you know, a crazy a uh, boar or fox or whatnot. There's little insects, pollinator uh, friendly gardens are great as well. I mean, there's so many ways that you can rewild your garden. Yeah. I also read an article saying that the um, RHS, the largest horticultural um, charity here in the UK has actually published a list saying that wasps are um, one of the creatures they want people to attract to their gardens. So. Unfortunately, some of these species um, have a bit of a bad reputation, um, but yeah, hopefully we'll see more wild gardens in the future. Okay, so most of you are interested in wildlife friendly gardens, 17% are, are interested in knowing more about, you know, what is a native plant, what, you know, how can we incorporate perhaps exotic plants as well without kind of disrupting um, the natural cycles that we have. What about invasive ones? You know, there's been um, a shift as well in what is traditional has been seen as invasive to, towards being called resilient uh, here in the UK. So I'm sure this is perhaps also something we see in other parts of the world. Okay. Thank you so much for all your fantastic contributions. That was extremely interesting. I think we can now move on to introducing our speakers finally. Right. Um, so our first speaker is the founder of How to Rewild. Um, he's also a communications lead at EcoSulis, whom we've worked with before. 
And uh, EcoSulis works to deliver nature positive solutions for partners such as the Wildlife Trust, the Environment Agency, and Severn Trent Water. He's an extremely, uh, he, I mean, Chris, apologies, Chris. <laughs> He's an extremely knowledgeable uh, rewilding practitioner, and so will be a great first speaker for today. So over to you, Chris. We look forward to hearing what you cooked up for us. Thanks, Alex. I'll just uh, share my screen here. I have to apologize as well. I don't have any chipmunks today. This is a chipmunk-free presentation. Uh, can you all hear me OK? Yes, awesome. Okay. So thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'll be talking about my biggest passion, which is where the science of rewilding meets the actual practical boots on the ground activity of getting stuff done. So I've got a uh, 3.5 acre patch of land um, in Somerset in the UK, which I use as a sort of testing ground for the theories and the science. And I roll out different interventions there, um, like a floating bog like laying a hedge and I see how they work in real life. This is the transformation I saw in one year on my modest little patch um, from August 2021, just before I bought it, to August 2022, after I put in the ponds and wildflower seeds, trees, um, let the grass grow a bit. Uh, I have barn owls, shell duck, clouds of butterflies, and in a year when many tree projects failed due to the drought in the UK, I had over 90% survival of the newly planted saplings on the project. So how did that happen? Well, I cut my teeth on rewilding in the garden, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Because yes, rewilding is often described as a landscape scale process. And Yes, it's true that larger projects can have bigger benefits for biodiversity. But that doesn't mean you can't boost biodiversity with rewilding principles at the scale of a garden or even a balcony or a window box. I slowly discovered the benefits of native plants and a rewilding approach through my interest in gardening, my garden out, out there. And my passion isn't really for animals, but it's actually for plants uh, because rewilding is often seen through the lens of animals, charismatic beavers, um, which are introduced across the UK or releasing wolves. Uh, but really on the scale of a small project or a garden, plants are far more important and what's more, they're much easier to get right. But before I dive into plants, let's take like a step back and see how we should approach rewilding in small spaces. What does science say? So rewilding was founded on this idea of the three C's. There's cause, corridors and carnivores. You reintroduce carnivores into core wilderness areas and then connect these core wilderness areas up to each other with wildlife corridors. And that seems really simple, but it just doesn't really work like that in many parts of Europe, especially in Britain. Because here in Britain, we've totally trashed our core wilderness areas and we just lost this biodiversity and this bioabundance that would support all these carnivores. If you've read Isabella Tree's great book, Wilding, um, it's a very UK centric book, but you'll have a good idea of what it means. The fields over here, especially in Europe, have been flattened, sprayed with pesticides, drained, pumped full of fertilizer. The soils has just been stripped and it's been crushed too. It's been like flattened to the point where water just sits on the top of it, runs off the surface straight into our rivers and increases nutrient pollution there. So biodiversity suffered a similar fate, but you know what? That's all negative stuff. And I really hate focusing on negative because that's just the kind of baseline. That's what we need to know when we're designing a solution to it. Because if you want to bring back nature, you have to undo a lot of these changes. You have to look at your garden and say, well, that's what's happened to it in the past. But if we want to restore this biodiversity, we have to add back in those lost bumps and those lost ponds. You have to chuck out all those pesticides and those fertilizers you've got sitting in the, you know, in the shed. That's equally true whether you have 10 hectares or whether you've got 10 square meters to work with or even a balcony. So in Europe, we might not be able to use the three C's of American rewilding, but we can use the three D's, which are dispersal, diversity and disturbance. Now, the three D's aren't actually that complicated. In fact, I've put this, this sort of chart together um, which I try and explain them all with in with one picture. So you can see that dispersal here, dispersal is about movement of animals through a landscape. 
but it's not just about animals it's about plant and fungi too but you might wonder like how can plants travel through a landscape they don't just get up and walk around but if you just take a look at your dog's fur after it comes back from a walk and those little spiky burrs which get stuck to it or if you glance up at the sky next to a sycamore tree when it releases its helicopter seeds and they spin through the sky you'll see how the seeds travel because Seeds travel along wildlife corridors, just like animals, and often attached to animals in their fur, in their paws, in their hooves, or in their intestines. So yes, dispersal is all about movement. It shows how connected your patch is to the wider landscape and how fragmented that landscape is too, how broken up those habitats are. Because listen, while it might not be easier to hear, it's easy to hear this, there's only so much you can do to attract wildlife if you live at the heart of Birmingham or Brussels or Baltimore. Your, your patch will score much higher for dispersal if you live near a park or a nature reserve or in the countryside even. So in a previous garden, um, it was in Bournemouth in the UK, I created like an urban oasis. It had loads of different um, types of vegetation, some native, some not. It was in the middle of a concrete housing development though. And I found it completely impossible to attract birds because that dispersal was just all blocked by, you know, the roads and urban development, the fences and walls and the blocks of non-native habitat like conif plantations and fields. But it's so much easier for me now because I live next to the sort of sprawling brambles and wild ivy of this cliff face, which is just up here, which runs all the way through my neighborhood. And there's a woodland just up the hill as well, which helps. If you want to improve dispersal, though, even if you're in a garden which is surrounded by concrete, there are a few fairly obvious things you can do. You can make your garden easy to access by putting holes in fences. You obviously ask the neighbours first. Make it more visible to flying wildlife by putting in a pond in trees. Some aquatic species, like um, some bugs, dragonflies, things like that, are sensitive to the polarised light which bounces off water, and that's how they find a new place to live. So ponds are really good for bringing in wildlife, which is flying over the top. It's worth finding out what animals are present in your local area already, because if they're already present and you plant the species they like to eat, they might come in. See, I saw a brimstone butterfly up on the cliff um, the first year I lived here, and I planted their food plant, older buckthorn, in the garden. And now I have so many of the things every year, and their caterpillars are so prolific that the poor plants barely survive the season with any leaves intact. They're just in complete tatters. But listen, I'm not suggesting that you'll rush out and buy older buckthorn because it might not be suitable for your, you know, your local habitat, your country even. The point is that my plants wouldn't have attracted any butterflies at all unless there was already some buckthorn in the local area, like the local park, local nature reserve, that the brimstones were feeding on and using as a kind of wildlife corridor to get to here. So you don't need to just religiously plant butterfly food plants you can get out into your local area and find out what's already out there visit the local park and use a plant id app and identify all the weeds or resilient plants super weeds whatever we call them now bushes the trees and then come back to your garden and plant those those native species because you you could actually collect the seeds as well because you can preserve all that really important local genetic diversity by doing that the thing about our native species is that they spent thousands of years living in our ecosystems. And that means they've developed these really complex webs of connected relationships with everything from like fungi to fish, birds to butterflies. So if you're planting native, you're helping to boost that second dimension, diversity from the bottom up. But diversity isn't just about biodiversity. It's also about the diversity of habitats, too. It's about the diversity and height of vegetation. You can see in this picture here, there's like this massive oak tree. This is at Nepa State where they've rewilded it. There's this huge oak tree, but there's also like um, blackthorn, there's roses, there's like grassland as well, like a lot of diversity in height. And this variety creates lots of, lots of little spaces, niches. And those are home for different species of invertebrate from hoverflies to bumblebees. And that means you shouldn't just create a woodland in your garden, but a woodland with glades. Hello, not, uh, not just a grassland, but a grassland with ponds and not just a xeriscape, but a xeriscape with a rain garden at the edge too. The edges of these habitats are really rich in niches. So 
Try and maximize the amount of edges you see in your garden. Avoid really big blocks of habitat and try and make a mosaic instead. Even a miniature, like a small garden, can have like a miniature version of a mosaic. So diversity is pretty self-explanatory, really. Once you know to plant native species and you know to create this mosaic, you're kind of on a roll. But disturbance is the last dimension, and that can be really hard to get right in a small space. In larger environments, disturbance means letting rivers shift over time. It means allowing trees to die and rot in place and leaving animal carcasses out in the open to do the same. But in small gardens, if you leave a dead badger in the middle of your lawn, it might raise a few eyebrows, you know. Um, ponds are a really good place to start with disturbance. They create a massive change to the topology, which is like the land surface, and the hydrology, which is the way that the water flows through the environment, through the soil. Ponds are a hub of life, but disturbance comes in in other forms too. Like if you leave dead wood lying on the ground for fungi and for invertebrates, and if you hack into thick vegetation from time to time, but not in the breeding season, you can break up the structure of that vegetation a bit. You can get rid of that really dominant vegetation and allow these kind of weaker species to thrive. It creates more diversity and it lets light down to the ground as well. Cut the grass every so often, but do it irregularly, do it unpredictably and leave some patches longer than others and even leave some patches long all year round. And my favourite tip comes from my favourite rewilding author, Ben Dick McDonald. He told me that he likes to be like a real pig in the garden sometimes. He replicates the action of wild boar by just randomly turning over bits of the lawn with a spade. I mean, I'm not sure what his neighbours think, but it's really good for insectivores, especially things like robins that will just follow them around and pick, a, pick at what's left over. But it also disturbs the seed bank and gets all of these weeds which are hidden under the surface. It gets them going again. Weeds. I say, even I do it, I shouldn't do it. <laughs> because the best way to recreate natural disturbance in a garden is to remember that you, you are an animal too, and animals create messy chaos. And messy chaos is what nature thrives on. But do remember that it's your garden too. So don't be afraid to have boundaries. Like it's easier to keep the rewilding going if you remember that you have to make room for people too. Like this is my son, he's on my rewilding project, but he's on a trampoline. Trampolines aren't naturally a part of rewilding projects, but they're a part of my rewilding project because I know that if I have a trampoline out there, it's much easier to get my son out there and he will spend a lot more time out there and I'll spend a lot more time out there. And it's important to make compromises and do things which mean that your garden will last because rewilding isn't just about nature. It's about creating sustainable landscapes that benefit both people and nature. Thanks for listening. Wow, that was very inspirational. Thank you, Chris. And I loved how you incorporated that trampoline. Um, it's important to keep an element of play and nature, as well as being sometimes harsh, is also playful. And, you know, there's new cycles of life all the time, um, especially in spring, which is why we're doing our event today. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. This, this was really great. Great. Um, so let's move on to our next presentation. We have um, the amazing Brandy Williams. Uh, hailing all the way from California, LA to be specific. Um, so Brandy is the founder of Garden Butterfly, and this is a boutique um, agency um, which works in uh, yeah, creating small scale and highly curated uh, ecologically friendly gardens. Um, Brandy is also very particular about making gardens pollinator friendly, which we all know is very important. Um, so yeah, um, on to you, Brandy. Thanks so much for being here so early in your day. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, let me. Begin and thank you, Chris, for with my presentation. Let's see, hold on guys. Okay. Okay, is it? Full screen, we're good? Okay, thank you for having me uh, this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to present on your platform, Intercity Pollinator Oasis in South Central Los Angeles. So this presentation will include images that um, I was able to capture uh, from our garden here in South Central LA. I thought that would be you know, the best way to present 
pollinators in our area and what we're doing. So garden butterfly is a lifestyle. It is about tapping in and being confident in your creativity, using your intelligence, your heart, and your experiences to develop something positive and something meaning meaningful and something that serves you and humanity. I'm Brandy Williams, founder and creative creator of Garden Butterfly, a small scale landscape company based in South Central Los Angeles. My education background includes an associate's degree in liberal studies, a bachelor's degree in business administration, a master's degree in human services, executive leadership. And the reason why I included all that, also I am a California licensed landscape contractor, but I'm telling you all that to say is I am not a scientist. I'm not an entomologist, but I turned my passion about pollinators into a business and brought forth garden butterflies. So that's the um, area that I'll be speaking um, to you from to you today. So my purpose is to encourage educators, homeowners, and community members to simply spend time in their gardens and to spend time in nature. I was fortunate enough to spend time with my great grandmother and both my grandmothers growing up, but primarily raised by my grandmother in Compton, California, who grew up on a farm in the segregated South. She and her siblings traveled West during the great migration to escape the horrors of the segregated South for a better life. She instilled the certain cultural and Southern traditions, which included resourcefulness and community service. So here you see to the left, we're in, I'm in my garden talking about pollinators. And what we've done on our street is we just created this network of neighbors where we open up our homes once a year and we just have a block party. And within that black par block party, uh, we barbecue, and we share our gardens and we do a, a crop swap. So this was one of our first uh, events. And I'm just talking about um, pollinators, uh, what we planted in our garden and we share food. Here in uh, South Central LA, many people think that we live in a desert. So if you come to California, you'll see a lot of gardens with succulents and planted with a lot of rock mulch, not really considering pollinators, but we live in a Mediterranean climate. It's much different than a dry and arid climate. So what we realized here is that we needed to um, just hold on to water conservation. Water conservation is a California lifestyle with plant selection. We do include succulents, but California natives, which are key, and California friendly plants, those plants that do uh, and work well or grow well in our area, but that are non-invasive. Um, we, we slow the runoff, store water for future, and we spread the water in our gardens and incorporate permeable surfaces. So if you look at the bottom right slide, you'll see this, actually it used to be a gravel walkway. This is in our garden, but you know, learning more about the best practices of uh, wildlife habitats and pollinator gardens, we took out the uh, garden, the uh, rock in that area and incorporated Daimondia which is, although it is not native, but it is a great uh, walkable ground cover. You see that right at the bottom of the um, bridge. So we replaced the gravel with a green walkable um, ground cover. Here in South Central LA at Garden Butterfly South LA, we think about the bees, moths, butterflies, and birds. And that's what I'd like to encourage people to do when designing their gardens. Uh, adult butterflies and moths, they will feed on a variety of uh, nectar plants. You wanna use all that organic mulch, which is an overwintering resource for pollinators. And hummingbirds use spider silk to build their nests. 
So our garden, even though my company is Garden Butterfly and I attract butterflies, but if you come here to South LA in our garden, you will see hummingbirds all throughout the day. And one reason I believe it's because I do keep the cobwebs in the garden. Very rarely, you know, do I take them away because I just enjoy seeing those uh, hummingbirds. And when I learned that they use spider silk to build their nests, I said, okay, Brandy, you're doing something right. So I just keep that spider silk in the garden. And you can even see to the bottom right, there is a potted Dudleya, which is a California a native succulent plant. And if you look closely, you see the uh, cobwebs. But, you know, I, I wanted to show you that to see how important I think it is. Uh, there's life in the soil. And, you know, you want to make sure you're keeping those um, leaves and you want that organic mulch, giving room for pollinators uh, to grow. 70% of native bee species are ground nesting and 30% of native bee species are cavity nesting. Now guys, check out this image. There's a woman named Crystal Hickman of BSIP. You should look her up. I invited her to our garden. She was able to identify seven different uh, native bee species. So a, another, you know, check on my list of, you know, doing well here in our area. And this is an image that she was able to uh, take in our garden. Um, it is a sweat bee and the images of the uh, Indian mallow. Sorry, it's a California native plant, but look how vast. Just look how beautiful and vibrant this image is. She's just very talented, and I just wanted to include that here. So I just thought it was just great to incorporate my personality. We all know that there are, you know, just different elements that are just universal of establishing a wildlife habitat or a pollinator-friendly garden. but. You know, I said, Brandy, you know, when, when I talk to my clients and just to, you know, get them interested, I added a few more. So one, we all know that uh, pollinators, they do need a water source, a food source, pollen and nectar plants, which provide food and energy for pollinators and host plants provide food for caterpillars. They need the cover and shelter, sustainable practices, including organic mulches, as I communicated earlier on, uh, limiting water use by installing native plants and a rainwater catchment system. And also growing your own food, you want to sit in the area and include art in the garden. So as you see here, we have art in the garden with, with uh, container plants. This is Garden Butterfly LA, guys. So at the top, when we purchased our property, this is how it looked. It was a traditional garden. But in time, we, transfer, we transformed our garden to a regenerative landscape, a sustainable landscape, and a pollinator habitat. We realized that our lawn wasn't environmentally healthy, and there was no edible agriculture for our local wildlife. So we just went in and just created this beautiful area. We attract native bees, beneficial insects. These are all the insects that we attract in um, birds. Here's some other images of what we're doing here. This is our garden where it's full of life and you see the different structures, height, form, and texture. You see how we've been able to incorporate California native plants and non-native plants, which are the ones that are uh, non-invasive, California poppies. You see all the color and just texture and layers. This is a scrapbook garden design where it's just color again, you see. We are growing our own food using those traditional foods uh, that my grandmother brought from the South, collard greens, tomato plants. There's chard, uh, we have bok choy and strawberries. So I just wanna just 
take you through this so you can just get an idea of what we're growing here. A Mediterranean garden. We have red buckwheat growing, California native red buckwheat. Poppies, we have monkey flower. And these are all native plants. California buckwheat, which is great for, um, it is a host plant for uh, caterpillars. And we also have the uh, fuchsia. So just thank you so much. I just wanted just to give you an idea of what we're doing here, what I'm doing, how I got started. And um, just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Brandy. Wow, what wonderful photos. You make me want to go to California right now. <laughs> so thank you very much for um, letting us in on your philosophy and also how rewilding gardens, it doesn't mean that a garden will by necessity end up looking, you know, what we would consider not beautiful, right? So there's still ways to have an aesthetic element. I mean, different people have different tastes. Um, what we've observed is that there is a decrease in love for that very neat mode down aesthetic. So that's a positive change that we're observing, um, at least here in the UK, but I'm sure in other places of the world as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Brandy. This was great. Um, and in LA too. <laughs> great. Um, yeah, so um, just moving on, we have, as I mentioned earlier, um, so Katie Van Munzer, who is a part of our rewilding community of practice, um, she is working together with her team on a uh, project which will help all of you rewild your gardens. Um, so yeah, they've prepared a few lovely little questions um, that I'd love to ask to you and for you to answer that would be very helpful um, and also fun to get to know all of you. So um, yeah, if we can get the poll questions on and uh, everyone can just reply to the questions. So the first question is, which of these are they the biggest priorities for you when planning your rewilding projects? And um, you can select up to three. So that's seed and seedling availability, edible native plants, um, attracting birds or pollinators or other wildlife. I mean, we've spoken about all of these things as well as minimizing water usage, particularly important in regions uh, plagued by droughts. Um, yeah, we've had a very hot summer last year over here, so it's becoming ever more relevant as well in um, places that traditionally haven't been as warm. Yeah. Um, also having a vegetable and fruit garden aesthetics. Okay. Anything else? Give you a few more seconds. Ooh, there's a very large diversity of priorities here. That's nice to see. Okay, so 77%, okay, 78% want to attract pollinators. Um, given the dire state of our little pollinator friends, that is a very positive thing. Can I please ask everyone who's not speaking to mute themselves? Thank you very much. And wasting less water, yes, yes. Okay, so we've had 52% participating. Please, everyone, feel free. Don't be shy. No one will know who's who. <laughs> okay. All right. So in the second question, how active of a participant would you be with an app-based rewilding community? Okay. Lots of people would browse photos of other gardens. So sort of Pinterest type uh, trend here. And connecting with other people, yes, it's so important to um, create a community of people sharing the same interests. I mean, that's basically what we're doing here. So, yes. And, okay, some of you would connect in person with this community. That is great. Okay. And, yeah, some people would share photos of their own, own gardens. And, okay, some people would not participate. That's also fine. <laughs> Okay, um, the last question, how long did it take for you to gain confidence in your ability to plant and plant native plants in your garden space? So only single answer for that. A lot of you don't yet feel confident and that's also part of why some of you might be here today. That's okay, we're all here to learn. And um, some of you have been pretty quick, fast learners, less than a year. 
35% of you even, wow, that's very impressive. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your contributions. Um, we'll now move on to our next speaker presentation. Uh, now we have Wankia. Wankia Ferguson is the founder of Flinder Bay Natur Town. So I speak Dutch. Don't feel bad if you don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> but it essentially means um, butterfly, you know, added to a natural garden. Uh, so similar uh, ethos as Brandy here. Um, so that's a design and ecological gardening firm uh, with a focus on animal friendly gardens. A lot of you have expressed an interest for pollinator and wildlife friendly gardens. So she'll be able to answer any questions later on on this topic. Um, but yeah, so Wankia is a landscape ecologist. Um, she has over 30 years of experience in ecological design and planting, has worked with many different organizations, including founding her own. So yeah, we will... Um, surely learn a lot from her. Over to you, Vankia. Thank you so much for contributing, contributing your um, expertise. Um, well, uh, rewilding gardens. Um, I have been an ecologist since uh, whatever, 1982, I think, but not always uh, working in gardens. Uh, I worked more in vegetation uh, uh, work uh, before I started with uh, pure gardens. Um, and um, yeah, just because I have an ecological interest, uh, for me, it was logical that uh, gardens should be animal friendly. So that's my focus in general. Um, here you see in the first slide, for example, um, the uh, birds, butterflies, uh, bats. Um, in the Netherlands, we have only bats which are um, eating insects. So it is very useful. Um, um, I don't know if I have to change the slide now or Jonas. Um, next one, yes. Um, here you see um, the landscape as it was once before, long time ago. Um, effectively, before uh, humans had a lot of influence on it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it, it probably consisted out of a tree, um, forest with open spaces. The open spaces were um, uh, how do you call it, caused by large grazing animals, just like it is in Africa, maybe not as much uh, a savanna as it is in Africa, but at least um, all kinds of species had their place in this combination of um, trees, open spaces, uh, variety between the open spaces and the trees, dead trees, and so on, like uh, Chris also pointed out. Like here you see in, in where streams are, there are dragonflies, where, where there are open spaces, there can be butterflies, uh, also in the trees sometimes, um, birds which use the, the seeds of trees, uh, hoverflies which use uh, um, holes in trees which are rotten to, um, uh, how do you call it, to um, multiply, etc. cetera. Um, this was all existing. Um, Probably humans were in between, but not dominant at that time. In the next slide, please. Um, nowadays, the Netherlands look like this, more or less. Um, we have extreme mono monocultures in the Netherlands. We have gardens which look like monocultures because they are mown up to uh, about zero. Uh, we have stone gardens. And we have a lot of gardens that we call prairie gardens because most of the plants are not native, they are from the United, St United States, in fact. Um, and they are, um, so they are important plants and um, very many are uh, really non-native. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, this, um, these non-native plants, like uh, uh, in the upper left side, can be beautiful, no problem at all. Point is, Often they are not very useful to um, the, the, either the butterflies or even the bees. The right side uh, picture up, upper right uh, shows, for example, some campanulas, um, which are important for those little bees um, down the, the third uh, picture from, uh, from the left. Um, these bees are completely dependent on this type of flower 
the second picture is a knautia. Uh, also, that bee is completely dependent on that flower specifically. Uh, even more left, the first down picture is um, a dasipoda uh, bee, and she is um, dependent on this uh, uh, type of um, uh, flowers which are uh, like the Astraceae, but well, they should be the native ones. And from an underfamily which is called the Chicoriodae, it's not just any any Astraceae she uses. She uses very specifically uh, certain plants. On the right, on the bottom, you see a butterfly which just dropped a, a small egg on. Um, uh, um, a Rumex, uh, uh, and this is her uh, host plant. Um, nectar plants are usually available. That's not not, and, and butterflies are actually not not very uh, selective on uh, on um, um, nectar plants. Neither are bees, but they're very very selective, or they can be very selective on host plants. Um, so a garden which is mainly um, consisting of non-native plants, it can it can to contribute in terms of nectar, yet it often doesn't contribute in terms of um, a lot of uh, other elements which uh, insects need. What happens if um, we uh, um, if you if you um, for a long time um, interfere with all the native plants and um, put them in fact effectively away, which is happening in the Netherlands. Uh, the result is that even in the end, you, you get red lists of insects, you get red lists of plants, you get red lists of, um, I don't know if you know what a red list is. It is a, a list on which we um, tend to express the vulnerability of insects in this, in this case but it can also be birds or it can be uh, bats or it can be anything. In our country, 80% uh, of the bees, uh, which are dependent on uh, fabaceae, so uh, plants like clovers, they are threatened at the moment. 80% is really an extreme lot for plants, which were once the most common you could think. Um, and um, so we have, managed as human beings to make these plants rare, which is really a feat, you could almost say. Yet this has a, an, an, um, an effect because, um, for example, not only certain species of bees are, are very dependent on, on this plant, also long-tongued bumblebees are dependent on clovers, on red clover uh, in our case. Um, these long-term uh, tongued bumblebees, they can um, pollinate uh, Fabaceae, they can pollinate, for example, certain bean plants. Other uh, short-tongued uh, bumblebees, they can't. Uh, they break in, like we call it. They, they try to get the nectar through a little hole at the side of the plant, but that means that they don't pollinate the plant anymore. So effectively, we lose a lot by losing biodiversity, not in terms only of how you call it diversity in plants, we lose also diversity in our food security. And we tend to think that honeybees can uh, give all the solution to everything, yet this is not true because these long tongued honey uh, bumblebees, for example, we need them for certain specific plants. Tomatoes in, uh, in our country and the whole family of Solanaceae can't be pollinated by um, the honeybees because tomatoes need bus pollination. This is an extra wing uh, effort of the, the bumblebee and you can hear it. It, it you, you, it's called bus pollinations. You can, can hear and this, this bumblebees that can get the pollen out of tomatoes and plants from the Solanaceae in general. Um, osmias, the, they, they can pollinate fruits much better than uh, honeybees and so on. All, all kinds of bees have specific uh, possibilities. And of course, fruits and seeds are not only there for us, they're also there for the birds and other animals who eat as much fruits and seeds as we do. 
So we don't have to think only in our food uh, production, we have also to think in food production for the other animals, in fact. So what to do? Well, rewilding a garden like this gar front garden uh, contains a lot of native grasses and native plants. And you see, for example, in the upper right, a, a, a very common butterfly, which actually in the Netherlands is not so common at all because we don't have these clovers in the garden. Because this, this butterfly, she uses a particular kind of lotus to put her eggs on uh, um, and uh, the caterpillars eat from that specific plant. In the left, in the right bottom, you see another butterfly which is using grasses um, to, um, to put her eggs on and she puts it very high in the, in the grass itself. So she, um, and you need to, to leave the grass the whole winter round. Otherwise you mow actually this butterfly away. Just go one slide back because uh, I forgot to tell you that. Um, this slide uh, was showing that 80% of the, um, the bees which are dependent on, on Fabaceae, um, so clovers and, and, and uh, plants in that family are threatened in, in our country and which is mainly due to this uh, co complete um, transformation of um, our environment. So go ahead again next. So you can um, actually uh, um, try to transform gardens in terms of putting more native plants in to make uh, garden meadows, to make roofs, um, uh, garden roofs. Next slide, please. And um, also by putting up hedges and um, extra uh, because a lot of butterflies, for example, they, they use um, um, certain specific plants uh, for their eggs uh, again. And this one also uh, completes in the winter all the... So make a lot of gardens which are um, uh, flowery uh, friendly, but also try to think about um, the um, needs of animals. Um, like in the Netherlands, we have lost this capacity a little. Um, we don't think in terms of, uh, we think in terms of beauty of gardens, but we don't think in terms of what, what do the butterflies need? They need native plants. Uh, what do the bees need? They need certain plants for their uh, um, uh, larvae um, and so on. And if we want to um, conserve or, or to, to put forward uh, a different type of gardens, I think we need to emphasize this more. And also, I think uh, in, in other countries, please don't try to lose your capacity of be proud of your own plants. Um, so in, in, I think also in terms of next generation, we need to, uh, to do this. Um, because I think the ne next generations or the next hand, they also have the right to, to see all the, the insects which we have and uh, we shouldn't lose so many. Um, welfare and, and luxury is not, is not important if you don't have biodiversity anymore. That, that is what I would um, tell you. Okay, that's it. Wow, thank you so much, Mankia, and thank you for yeah. ending on this note and uh, thinking of everyone. Um, I mean, we're a global group, so thank you very much for that. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, um, so I won't um, talk all too much, but um, introduce instead Candy, uh, full name Eva McCandy. Um, so uh, Candy is the founder of The Light on a Hill. Uh, which is a community-based organization focusing on environmental conservation and restoration. Um, she is primarily a community developer, so we've now heard from, you know, scientists um, and, and non-scientists alike. Um, she focuses really on building communities and how um, rewilding can contribute to that. So over to you, Candy. Yes, amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Alexandra and all the wonderful presenters. Um, as you've heard, my name is Candy and I'm a founder of um, a community-based organization known as Light on a Hill, based in Meru, Kenya. And I'm so happy to be here and thank you for everyone who's uh, made the time to be with us today. Yes, thank you Jonas for 
sharing the screen, please let's go to the next screen. Yeah, so uh, Light on the Hill's uh, vision and mission is basically to just uh, have us act as hosts and catalysts uh, to communities and try help them find sustainable solutions to some of the challenges uh, they're facing in a bid to reduce uh, a challenge that is mainly um, so present in communities, especially working with nonprofits of dependency. So we just try to empower them to own their own journey of sustainable development. Next. Yes, so I'm so happy with the presentations from everyone uh, because it's all a story of passion. And this too here is a story of a great passion I have, which is working with communities. And I'm so happy with the last presentation that uh, one here just did uh, and the last slide of inspiring the future generation, uh, which is the main focus I have. I work with kids. Uh, mainly kids aged five to twelve, and um, it's it's so inspiring. Why I did this? Uh, uh, falling back on brandy, I was raised by my grandma, uh, who was an educator uh, by profession, and also a lover of nature and conservation, and also a farmer and a lover of uh, animals. So I grew up. I have very many fond memories in my childhood. Uh, together with my brother, uh, because we were just brought up in a very beautiful environment. And the inspiration behind finding founding Lower Soil was because uh, over the past 15 to 10 years, I have seen my community's land degrade. And I had this great burden in my heart to just come in, having worked uh, in so many communities uh, in my country, I was sure that it was about time in 2020 to now give back to my community and try and just work with them to find solutions uh, to some of the challenges that uh, climate change had caused, especially being that uh, we are a community that, um, that greatly depends on agriculture for their livelihoods. Uh, and my focus areas now in Light on a Hill, we focus on environmental conservation and restoration, uh, by using uh, avenues of environmental education and talent naturally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you'd ask why environmental conservation? As I shared, we are, um, I come from a community that depends on agriculture, mainly for their livelihoods. And uh, over the years, uh, it's been seen that maybe agriculture coming from a personal perspective and a community perspective, it's viewed as a dirty job, as a job not to be appreciated. And I just chose to challenge this uh, as a person because uh, in a bid to uh, to just inspire, to we just don't, I just don't aim at uh, educating, I aim at inspiring these young generations to believe in passion and a uh, reason why another reason why I came back home was to just show them how far that uh, how far passion can take you, and why it's so important that you need to bring back um, an environment close to what I grew up knowing. There are so many butterflies, there are so many bees, there are so many different birds. But over the years, I could no longer hear all these bird chips. I grew up hearing, and um, through this now, that's why I really uh, focus to come back and train and work with these children to just help them know that it's so beautiful, like being in nature and uh, just connecting with nature and uh, appreciating all the benefits that come from having a very healthy uh, ecosystem and a very healthy biodiversity around where you live. And now we can go back, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, now, with uh, our environmental education, uh, we really focused on outdoor learning. Outdoor learning, why? Because I want to give children a feeling of nature, a place where they can connect with nature, a place where they can feel the fresh air and love it, a place where they can touch the soil. 
and just love how beautiful it feels on your hand. A place where they can just um, go on a nature walk and love all the bad chips they hear and come across a butterfly and they're just amazed at the beauty of this butterfly. And uh, over now close to three years, this has been so evident um, and so inspirational to me personally. Uh, having one child or a parent call me and they're like, you know, Candy, uh, I don't know <laughs> what's happening, but uh, let's say um, Trevor has been bugging me about uh, just planting this uh, fruit tree behind our, uh, our backyard. And it's so inspirational for me and it's so motivating to me just hearing that uh, all these small efforts uh, we're putting in are really transferring to their homes, are changing the mindsets of these children. They now don't see any more like uh, being in the rain, like just watching the rain pour, and they're just so amazed and they're like, wow, how does this happen? And um, that's the story we just seek to uh, inspire among children. And now, for instance, uh, there are these photos here. Um, another story we have like uh, during like long seasons that we have different seasonal fruits. So for instance, when it's, uh, let's say an avocado or um, we just ask children, uh, hi children, so I know maybe today some of you will have avocado for their dinner. So how about uh, you just, uh, after you're done with the avocado, you can bring us uh, an avocado seed, then we'll uh, just try and develop a plant from it. And it's amazing how cooperative children are. Uh, like for instance, here we have Vanessa, uh, she had just brought in her avocado seed and we were trying to propagate it. Uh, we do this uh, in our greenhouse and sometimes in reused plastic bags. Uh, so, uh, and uh, having them watch this journey, having them included in, um, in watering, in taking care of these seedlings and now seeing a plant shoot from just a seed is so mind, uh, mind blowing for these children and also so inspiring for them to just believe in uh, the process of growth. And also it uh, translates to uh, another aim I have is for it to transfer, uh, to translate in their personal lives, to learn to respect the growth process. We know sometimes uh, in life, um, as we grow, we might face challenges, challenges such as droughts uh, that our plants face. And we need to maybe mulch these plants we need to keep on watering them. We need to find ways to adapt to different uh, seasons we are in life. And watching these seeds uh, still survive through the seasons is a huge encouragement for these children to follow through in their lives. And that's the hope and uh, I hope to inspire in them even as they grow older to just learn to appreciate different seasons in their lives and on my right, uh, we have a photo of a classroom we developed, a 100% eco-friendly classroom, uh, whereby now we inspire learning through digital learning, uh, through maybe projecting um, documentaries that are environmental based, maybe on wildlife and different sorts, because you know, in a very digital world, and uh, you know, as we say, like a photo uh, communicates a thousand words, so we just try and incorporate also digital and audiovisual learning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and now we also have a different aspect of learning, which is talent nurturing. And uh, we mainly do this outdoors. And by outdoors, we call different events, like the one on my left, um, where we see our children holding a canvas. Uh, these are uh, art that was created from recycled materials, uh, like cloth materials. And it was a partnership from a long friend of mine who gave back to us. Uh, he's a nail artist, but now he came in uh, to support our children uh, to develop art from, um, from, from, uh, from recycled materials and uh, they created art based on what they saw in their surroundings. So you can see trees, you can see flowers. And on my right, we also had a very good friend of mine who came in and taught the children to 
develop art from recycled glass. So they find solutions to some of the challenges our environment is facing, that is pollution from material, from plastics, from glass, and they make amazing art from it that they can take back home and just be inspired to keep on connecting and finding uh, solutions and seeing uh, maybe something that you see as a problem, but seeing it as a solution or as an opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Andy, um, just so a gentle you're actually already over time so unfortunately yeah. we'll ask you to wrap up but this yes, is really so, yeah so thank you so much uh we've had uh, tremendous impacts uh uh cutting across developing uh, nurseries to um mentoring and inspiring young restoration stewards all over my community and as you see here we develop a nursery from recycled like milk uh, packaging uh and uh, we've had tremendous of course uh solutions and achievements so far and on the next slide please yeah um maybe current needs uh are yes so maybe we can go next uh maybe i'll share that later uh you're most welcome uh, after this uh presentation feel free to send any questions in the chat box and i'll be happy to respond according to my capability and next slide please um thank you so much and those are our social media handles feel free to follow us and my message us in case you have uh any follow-up questions or uh, contributions thank you so much Thank you so much, Candy. That was really wonderful and inspiring. Um, we've now had all the different speakers showing different perspectives and also ways of engaging the community uh, in rewilding gardens. Um, so now on to our next, um, well, speakers, I will say they're not part of the actual speakers, but they will present their project and this, this is, um, yeah, Katie's team. Um, so Ken, Kelsey and Lori, if you could please share your screens um, yeah. and tell the audience a little bit more about what you do. That would be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, hi, we are Wild Garden. We're a small global organization brought together by the desire to fight climate change. Uh, our mission is, I'm sorry, got too far here. Uh, we're led by rewilding community of practice member Katie Van Munster, and my name is Lori Ike. Hi, and I'm Kelsey Kazis, and we're here to tell you about the app that we're developing. All right, take it away, Lori. All right, so our mission is to regenerate the world's natural habitats by empowering individuals to restore native species within their own garden spaces. Um, simply put, we're just trying to increase global biodiversity one garden at a time. We believe that as the rewilding movement continues to catch the attention of individuals around the world, there's still this barrier to entry that's preventing people from taking direct action in their own plantable spaces. And one thing we've heard from a lot of gardeners so far is, oh my gosh, I've killed so many plants trying to figure this out. I really need help. Um, and we know that there are a lot of great gardening resources out there to help people. There's a ton of fantastic rewilding educational sources as we've heard about today. Um, but we've been struggling to find a tool that really combines uh, these efforts uh, together. We think there's an opportunity here to support rewilding projects while also making the planning process simpler and less overwhelming for novice gardeners. So we're building the Wild Garden app to solve these problems for the expanding rewilding community. Our goal here is to simplify the decision process. We're here for those gardeners who don't have the confidence and experience to start rewilding on their own. We're also a tool for more experienced gardeners who want a consolidated resource for planning and garden maintenance. Uh, Kelsey is now going to talk a little more about our solution. Thanks, Lori. Our goal is to build the best possible solution that delivers gardeners with simple and concise information to help them accomplish their gardening projects. We're helping people conceptualize their space and understand all the factors that go into rewilding a garden. The app will help users identify which native plants will have the best chance of thriving in their space. And to do this, we consider the local climate, any known soil characteristics, as well as the sun and the shade. Gardeners then have the opportunity to tell the app what is most important to them, whether that is building a pollinator garden filled with birds and bees, planting edibles, or saving money with drought tolerant plant options. Once the app understands your parameters, it will help you design and customize your garden. 
taking into account things like the final growing footprint, distribution of the plants, as well as uh, any sort of companion plants or invasive species that you have to be thinking about. Through Wilding, community of practice is an incredible example of a community that is passionate and of people gathered around a unified goal. And we really want our app to embody that passion. Wild Garden is an opportunity to create connections on a local level and have neighbors support one another in their rewilding projects um, with not only the opportunity to share knowledge, but resources as well. Our app will be a one-stop shop to get inspired for your rewilding project, as well as connect with neighbors to share seeds and clippings, engage with experts, and as well as source native plants. We hope that you all get involved, and by being part of this early on, you will help shape the app into exactly what you need. We encourage you to head on over to our website, wildgarden.earth, and sign up to be a beta tester for the app. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and hand this back on over to Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kelsey and Laurie. Um, I think a lot of the audience member will find your solution very helpful. At least I know that I will. Um, but we're short on time, so let's quickly move on to the discussion and Q&A. Right, okay. Um, if we can just have all the speakers up. Sorry, we're just trying to figure this out here. Um, okay, perhaps we can get started as it is. Um, so we've had a few questions from the audience and um, I'll just start with the first one, which is, you know, how can we support rewilding on a town level, for instance, by encouraging local councils to keep green or to have wild spaces near, near new developments? Um, this was asked by Abigail. So anyone can answer that from the speakers. Um, yeah. I, I will just say uh, one way is just to um, just educate yourself and uh, to not, and just to understand that you don't have to be a scientist. So once you educate yourself and then you educate your children and then, you know, hopefully your, uh, the teachers will be educated about rewilding and plants and incorporating, um, you know, plants and gardening into the curriculum, just knowing that it just starts with you. And then you just sharing that information with your neighbors. And then if you have someone who can, you know, go to these meetings and then effectively communicate, you know, the importance of rewilding, you know, that's one way to start. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so another question that came from Madulika was, right. you know, is it okay oh, to chip in on that one as well? Yes, of course. Sorry. Yeah, like um, when it, the the organisation I work for, EcoSeelist, we're working with um, councils uh, as well, and one of the ways which we get them on board is basically communicating the the value that rewilding can bring in terms of like the the cost savings you can get because if you're using rewilding in terms of uh, using native planting, you can save because you're not losing trees because they're not suitable for the habitats. Um, you're reducing the amount of maintenance which is required for habitats because you're increasing the kind of wildness of a habitat and therefore you're reducing the, you know, the, the people hours required to maintain it. Um, so there is quite often councillors are concerned about the cost of them. Um, so it's, it's worth communicating with them about costs, um, not not just about like the, the the values assigned to it. Thanks, Chris. Um, our next question was: um, As a complete beginner to rewilding, um, how do I go about finding out what is native for my region, country? And um, the person who asked the question is based in Kent in the UK. So, Chris, I believe you would be um, the best person to answer that. Yeah, yeah. If this is in Germany, I could tell you um, that I've just been told that there's a very good resource for Germany um, in the UK. Uh, we have a we have um, something called the National Biodiversity um, National Biodiversity Atlas, something like that, um, which is basically a resource which uh, documents all of the different species across um, the UK. But that's very UK specific. 
Um, there's a great um, uh, online resource called Restore, R-E-S-T-O-R. Um, and if you put in your your plot of land on it, it will it will in the future it should should show you what plants, what native species are available there. But it also tells you a lot of stats about your land and allows you to see it over time and some useful information for rewilders. Um, but yeah, I would open that up to other people because I think um, resources for that are kind of lacking, and I think that's where the new app might help. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um... We have another speaker question, um, and that one is for Brandy, actually. So did you have any trouble, um, you know, with any of the rules set out by localities to have the same looking front yard, you know, like height of grass, et cetera? Um, so that can be a problem in the U.S. I think we all know the U.S. loves the neat, nice hedges and um, to look sort of similar. So what was your experience, Brandy? Well, yes. So in our area, um, our municipality, they do have rules and regulations for like, let's say shrubs that you plant on the parkway, you know, they can't be I believe it's like, above three feet high. Um, so, you know, it was just following those rules. But it's it's simple. There are so many native plants um, that there are so many, many plants that are native to our area, you know, that didn't bother me not one bit. I just chose, you know, which plants that were uh, allowed and uh, went with that. Um, a great resource for us, which is uh, the Theodore Payne Foundation. I mean, there's just a long list of plants to choose. So just knowing what grows well in our um, area code, our zip code and in our planting zone, you know, I didn't let that deter me not one bit, but it's good that they do have those restrictions because, you know, you want to rewild, but you want to make sure that it's safe, you know, for cars that park and then for people to walk by. Yeah. Does anyone else want to chip in on that? Perhaps not U.S. specific, but, um, you know, in your own geographies. No. Okay. Um, I think in the Netherlands we have the same problem eh? that that there are a lot of lots of uh, regulations. You can't uh, plant trees uh, uh, to completely to the edge of your garden. You have to to take an account uh, some distance from the from the edge, and um, um, so there there are similar uh, regulations to that. And then also one thing I would uh, add to the previous uh, question, in fact. Um, really maintaining uh, uh, good um, uh, public spaces uh, is not very much cheaper, I would think, Chris, because um, if you mow, for example, really correctly for, for uh, insects, it becomes far more small scaled. Um, so in, 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 in essence, you, you need more manpower for that and you need actually also people who know the plants which is a, a, a problem sometimes. Um, in the Netherlands, we do have also a very uh, good resource for uh, recognizing plants. We call it Verspreidings Atlas Flora uh, or the Flora of uh, Nederland. Um, so we have lo lots of maps where we can actually find exactly which plant grows where. Uh, a very good resource to, to recognize native plants. Yeah, that's great. That's so useful to know. And perhaps if it's not too much to ask, um, the speakers could share kind of these resources and then we can share that in the follow up email. I think that would be much appreciated. Um, yeah, we only have two more minutes left. I have one more question um, for Candy. And the question is, how does community based conservation and restoration work differ from other approaches? And, you know, what are some of the benefits? I think the benefits were definitely um, discussed, what, but what are some of the challenges of this approach? Um, thank you, Alexandra. So um, I think I'll just add up to uh, community, the benefits is um, everyone just shared that the they have projects and these projects um, affect other people around them. So for instance, if it's having now new birds coming, new bees or different insects. So uh, if the community gets to own and 
love the project you're doing and appreciate the need for this. Uh, maybe like uh, what I think Chris shared about talking to your neighbors and having maybe holes in the walls. Uh, that's where now community comes in. We need to work together. Uh, you might have really good ideas, amazing ideas, but if you walk alone, if you do things alone, uh, then um, unfortunately uh, that will not be sustainable. And the challenges are uh, quite a few or many. <laughs> I want to uh, focus on the positive, just as Chris said, uh, but uh, we have challenges. For instance, myself, um, a young son, and I come from a community that is quite patriarchal. So sometimes our ideas are not so much appreciated. And also it takes a long time to have the kind of uh, impact maybe you hope to have because of maybe financial constraints, constraints to move to other places you really hope to get to, maybe to other schools. For instance, I partner with schools, local schools. And it's a great challenge, especially maybe, and also all the scientific questions being asked. Sometimes we fall short on that. We don't have like the scientific knowledge and we really hope to have now, um, for instance, now partnerships with uh, experts, uh, maybe ecologists such as Wankia and all those other people. So uh, it's a challenge sometimes, but as Randy maybe said, it's, it starts with you, like uh, you spark the change you really hope to see. And with time, people now get to come in and appreciate your work. And I have this small quote as I wrap up. Uh, coming together as we are right now is a beginning. Keeping together is a progress, like keeping up this conversation and these partnerships and working together is success. So working together as a community, whichever part we are in the globe, is success. So I encourage everyone to uh, inspire and hopefully work with more communities and more people, more generations. Let's leave no one behind. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a beautiful way to end. Um, thank you so much, Candy. Um, unfortunately, we're already one minute over time. Um, I know there's still quite a few unanswered questions, um, but we will make sure to share those with the speakers and hopefully um, get them answered and then we'll send them out to every each and every one of you. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your questions. Um, thank you also to all the speakers. This was really inspiring on so many levels. Um, I appreciate some of you getting here very early, um, others having to run off to take care of your kids. So I don't want to keep anyone longer um, than necessary. But last but not least, um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. And we would love to keep in touch with you. Um, some of you might already follow us. If not, give us a follow. Um, on Rewilding COP, that's Rewilding COP on Instagram. Or if you're inspired by all these talks and would like to become an active community member after Candy's wonderful, um, yeah, um, quotes on community building, uh, feel free to reach out via email or Instagram. Our email address is rewildingcop at gmail.com. And lastly, thank you to our amazing partners.